and every one of you that uh, took up the challenge this morning and are here with us tonight. Um, so I'm going to do just a brief review, kind of where we've been so far, and then we'll get in uh, to chapter 12. Uh, so just to catch us up, uh, the outline by Griffith Thomas uh, lets us know that the book of Romans is a book of righteousness. Right? The first two and a half chapters are about the righteousness that is needed by sinful men. Uh, chapters 3 and 4 are about the righteousness provided by God and received through faith. Uh, chapters 5 to 8 are about the righteousness experienced in the soul and the righteousness guaranteed as a permanent blessing. Uh, chapters 9 to 11 are about the righteousness rejected by the Jewish nation and a righteous God who will redeem them uh, one day. And now for the remainder of the book of Romans, the epistle to the Romans, we're going to be talking about righteousness that's manifested in practical life. Because God's righteousness allows us a right relationship with him, which makes for right relationships with others. In other words, this is Christian living God's way. Or how to love my crooked neighbor with my crooked heart. <laughs> so... Uh, we're going to be talking about separation and service of the sons of God in chapters 12 and 13, about how to be God's images, how do we bear his image, or how not to take God's name in vain. Uh, and that commandment has, is really not about naughty vocabulary. Right? We represent him, we take his name upon us as Christians, and so we don't want to take that name into the world in vain. Right? So we're going to be talking about relationships, relationship to God in the first couple of verses. And it's going to be here in chapter 12. And it's about how and what we present, okay, or the present that we give to God. Uh, and it's going to be found in the meaning of the word yield. Uh, in the subsequent verses, 3 to 8, it's about relationship to the gifts of the Spirit. 9 to 16 is about the relationship to unbelievers, or sorry, to believers. And then 17 to the end of the chapter is our relationship to unbelievers. Uh, and then chapter 13 about will be about our relationship to government and then to neighbors. Okay? So in that list, note all of the law, all of the Torah is represented there, right? Uh, and that is summed up in love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. <coughs> so, to set this up in chapter 12, uh, we have seen Paul's pattern of teaching, and it is this, that doctrine precedes ethics and is foundational to it. He teaches us what we must believe that is the credenda, the things to be believed. We think credentials, right? It identifies uh, who someone is. And then he moves on to teach us how we are to live in the light of that doctrine. He moves from what must be believed to what must be done. We call that an agenda. But it is not possible to be faithful and go straight to the agenda. Whatever we do, we must therefore do. In other words, Paul is demonstrating how God translates the learning into living. Right? Um, so a caveat here, a lot of this is going to be for believers. And if you are not one, then we say come and welcome to Jesus Christ. Right? Uh, if you are not a believer then, and have not trusted Jesus Christ for salvation, it's my sincere hope that these words would provoke you to envy. Right? And we might think, well, envy, that's not a very Christian word or concept. But there is nothing more evangelical uh, than to proclaim the good news of salvation in Christ and provoke unbelievers to want what we have in Christ. That is envy sanctified. But this fallen world runs on the wrong kind of envy. All right, so what we're going to do, told you it was going to be a little bit different. Uh, so I'm going to encourage you to teach me tonight, right? Uh, it's not that I am not without notes, um, because the, the world might end, the Lord might come back if uh, I did not have a note set. Um, but 
what we're going to do is go through the book. And as you read chapter 12, essentially uh, every word of every verse essentially teaches and preaches itself. But we want to pull some things out, look at some of these words, uh, and see how they really apply to the Christian walk. Okay? Uh, and, I, and I'm confident that everybody that here is going to have a little bit different perspective, and it's going to speak to each one a little bit differently, and yet still moving in the direction. All right? Because it is all about Jesus. So there's 21 verses. Um, so it's, what I'd like to do is read the chapter, uh, but instead of me reading the chapter, uh, why don't we just uh, get a few people to help us out, read about seven, uh, seven verses each, and then just go, go through it. Anybody want to volunteer for the first seven? And while you're thinking about if you want to volunteer, here's the thing. <laughs> if, if, you, if, if there is no, yeah, so... So tonight's, tonight's lesson is going to invoke those, those two um, most hated words in Baptist circles, audience participation. Right? So um, now if, if there gets to be radio silence, um, I, don't, I don't want anybody in the parking lot to think we're not here. So uh, the, the threat is I will be obliged to fill that silence. Um, so, um, so yeah, who wants the first, first set? Brother, brother. Uh, yeah, Thunder Doma, or, okay, Brother Jim, first, first seven. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, <coughs> but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God has set to every man the measure of faith. For if we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, but we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Having in gifts to bury according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, whether prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministry, or he that teacheth on teaching. Brother Keith, next seven. possible as much as life in you 
live peacefully with all men clearly or dearly and they focus smile <laughs> dearly beloved avenged and not yourselves but rather give place unto wrath for it is written vengeance is mine I will repay saith the Lord it makes you want to preach right there amen <laughs> therefore if thine enemy hunger feed him if he thirst give him drink for in so doing thou shalt heap coals afar upon his head be not overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And those are the words of God for the people of God. So, I'll take the first duck first, and um, just to kick this grand experiment off, and then we'll kind of go through the subsequent both verses um, together, and, and at the end of this one, we'll reflect on, on verse 1. So, Paul starts out by telling... Uh, the church at Rome, and I want you to think about this. This is an epistle. It's the epistle to the Romans. So this is read aloud in churches just like we did, okay? And so the believers in the Roman churches are hearing this, and what are they thinking? What, what are they uh, receiving from Paul? Are they getting his message? What is his message? At first he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren. So what's the therefore, therefore? Right? There's always something that precedes that therefore. Well, that's verse 36 of uh, the previous chapter. For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Right. So everything comes from God and he's speaking to the brethren or brothers and sisters. So he's talking to the church. He's talking to fellow Christian believers who are in the same covenant of grace. Okay. It says, by the mercies of God that ye present, right? So that word has a connotation, right, of commitment, right? Present, <coughs> commit, uh, almost like a wedding, right? It has a sense of permanence <coughs> once and for all. And what do we present to God? Well, we present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. <coughs> Living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. Can any of us in and of ourselves do that? But it is a commandment, right? So who's that talking about? What's that reflecting? He's telling us to do it because it's talking about the only sacrifice who was holy and acceptable unto God, and that was Jesus Christ, right? in his obedience on the cross. And that's what masculinity means, the glad acceptance of sacrificial responsibility. That's what the last Adam did, that the first Adam did not. Right? And so just like uh, the willing sang this morning, he never gave up on me. Christ was completely and totally obedient to the Father. And so that's what we are commanded to be. We are commanded to imitate Christ uh, in our bodies, right? Presenting everything that we are, right? Uh, which is your reasonable, right? Not just a good idea, not just a maybe, not just a suggestion, uh, and not something that Paul's just pulling out of the air. It's reasonable. It's a logical conclusion. It just makes sense that we are to imitate Christ in his obedience and in his sacrifice. Uh, it makes sense because if we connect all the dots in the Old Testament and we put all of that together in the light of the whole counsel of God, that's the picture we see, right? It's reasonable and it's our service, right? Whenever we see the word service, we should think worship, okay? Worship and service go together, uh, just like in the book of Leviticus, all right? And what do we worship with? Well, with our bodies, right? The living sacrifice with our mind, our mouth, uh, our hands, and our feet, not just our butt in the pew. Right? <laughs> so, uh, Amen. We, we, yes. 
reasonable. That's not anything special. Absolutely. Not anything extra. We've not done something great. That's reasonable. Amen. Right? right? Amen. So sometimes we get, so we hear testimonies, right? Testimonies about people who were in like egregious sins and they were out in the world uh, and because they were forgiven much, uh, they loved much. Uh, and then there's a joke that Tim Hawkins has that says, oh, I wish, you know, I had an addiction too, so I could just have a testimony, right, as good as theirs. Um, and we tend to miss people who grow up in a godly home and are brought up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And it is that reasonable conclusion, right? It is the everyday obligation of the Christian, not the super Christian, to do that, right? It's the reasonable. That's, a, that's exactly that's exactly right. Um, we sang there's power in the blood this morning. And what is it? The fourth stanza say, but would you do service for Jesus, your king? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily his praises to sing? There's power, wonderful power in the blood. Uh, that's that reasonable service demonstrated. Okay? Mm -hmm. So we love God with all heart, mind, soul, and strength. Because that's how Christ loves us. Right? Then the second commandment is like unto it. We love our neighbor as ourselves. How? We don't do it with our love. We do it with his love. Right? That's where it comes from. That's where it's generated from. Um, all of that belongs to God. And he gives it to us. And when we uh, yield our bodies as a living sacrifice, we are like that little child. Uh, who borrows $5 from his father to buy his father a Christmas present, right? Um, but if you're a wise father, you'll probably give him $20 because you'll get a better gift and that's <laughs> that'll account. It'll teach him about inflation at the same time, right? So, um, so we're giving back to God. We're submitting those things he gave to us. And when we do that, he'll just grace us with more. Um, and, and that's more life and life more abundant, okay? Um, and this idea of the body, right? Um, what know you not? That your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Uh, we went from Old Testament sort of dead meat sacrifices, right? And now in the New Testament, these sacrifices, us, we're living stones in this new living structure that God is building, and it's called the New Jerusalem, right? And Paul told us earlier in Romans that we are to yield our members as instruments of righteousness. You see, we yield, and God wields them to his glory, right? And like Isaac, we'll die to self and will willing, sub, willingly submit to the will of God because he gives us everything, his righteousness, Christ's inheritance, and the infused spirit of God in us. So, everything. Brother Kate, when you look at the word present, the thing that comes to my mind is uh, there's action required on our part. Right. Mm -hmm. right. And that is not a works type of religion. It takes faith. <clears throat> I'm going to lay it all down and submit it to God's will. Right. Absolutely. Other, other reflections thoughts verse 1 right about now you're thinking there's 21 right <laughs> okay uh, all right so the next verse be not conformed to this world but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of god thoughts what do you think what do you think that's about How about just the phrase, be not conformed to this world? Hard to do? Easy? It reminds me when my son, when he was in high school, uh, uh, we would always say, my main lay people told us to teenagers, well, so-and-so let their son go downtown to buy their candy <laughs> bunny or go out and whatever. But I told him, uh, I remember telling him, I said, just because all his buddies go jump off a cliff doesn't mean you can't <laughs> go with them. Conformed to the world starts at a young age, and 
and we are to be separate the sheep and the goats. You know, it's a human nature to be conformed about what what we're surrounded by all the time. Right. It pulls you in to be conformed to see or be a light to what's going on around you. You know, it's a, it's part of human nature to separate yourself and not be part of the world or made like the world or act like the world. It is human. That's why we need a human nature. That's absolutely right, Miss Frieda. That's why he, um, you know, God's solution to that um, is he puts us to death in Christ and raises us up in Christ. And uh, we are made new. We are made new. Absolutely. Well, there again, you know, it's, uh, I lost my thought, but we control. up in a few verses later this concept of koinonia uh, fellowship what it means to be a living thriving Christian community the body of believers you know. it's so easy to conform to the things of the world and that's this outside part you know it's so easy just to slip right into things around you and the things of the world but when you get saved when you give your life to Jesus, that inner man changes. It's forever. It will not, what you say, sin again because it's saved forever. And that part's always continually fighting with this outside fleshly part. And it's like Brother Jim says, if we don't keep our in mind God and the will of God and feed that inner man then the outer man is going to win and the only, only hope we have is in Christ we, we can't ourselves save our, I mean save ourselves from the world only God only the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ can do that and when we accept him, oh Lord, with everything we have, we accept him and that inner man is changed. It's renewed, it's reborn, and it's saved forevermore. That soul cannot be lost again. And if we don't feed him though, this outside man is gonna win over in our, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? In our, what we stand for, right. in the in the world, the, as the world views us, you know they can't see that inner man as saved, but we can slip back, and that's when a Christian hurts the will of God by conforming to the things of the world, right. and that's I believe that's what this is talking about. You know, we can't, we can't drift back. You know, I was thinking, you know, it says uh, transforming by the renewing of our mind. You know, Christ says to die daily, or Paul says to die daily, you know, and the Bible says create in me a clean heart, O oh God, renew a right spirit within us. And I think that's an everyday conscience, conscious thing that we have to do, get up every morning to say, you know, good morning, Lord, and put that whole armor you know, the helmet of salvation and the, the breastplate of righteousness and get our minds set on the things of the Lord because it's so quick, uh, you know, when even you have children, it's so quick to get up and, and get distracted really quick. I think sometimes we have to beat everybody up in the morning to spend that time with the Lord so we can feel the presence of the Lord and, and just have his presence and, and 
to help us renew our mind so we can walk in the spirit every day because if we we don't take but a few minutes or seconds to get up and just make the wrong move uh, you know going to you know if you eat breakfast before you talk to the lord you're already burning something or, or trying to hurry up and go do something else and you're not going to get back to that and you, the whole day's gone and you're in chaos and by the end of the day you're like well, i'm sorry lord i didn't talk to you like i should have so right. i think it starts like it says transforming the renewing of our minds daily, we have to get up and self-consciously speak to the Lord and, and, and wait and see if he speaks to us to guide us. And, and I remember Don, Brother Don, saying, you know, uh, before our feet could touch the, the, the floor, you know, to guide our hands, our minds, our feet, where they go and, and give us direction and open doors of opportunity to witness the people. And I think that, that kind of keeps us... <coughs> dying daily to our flesh and, and renewing our minds towards Christ. Right. And, and the word you, to pick up on is this idea of doing it consciously, right? There is nothing in the Bible that has anything to do with sort of this uh, blind, um, unthinking uh, type. It's, it's belief. Uh, that's not faith, right? Faith um, uh, is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things so we do it consciously and, and picking up on something y'all were talking about this I like the concept of we are what we worship right and worship has to do with where do you put your attention your devotion your energy what is the object of your faith is it Christ or is it the world right and so if that's the object of our faith then we'll make idols of things like our children like our job and we'll we'll Everything will be focused on them. Uh, that will be our worship, our service. That's what the government will put our faith there. Um, you know, uh, doctors, heaven forbid, right? Because they can't tell Alzheimer's from a urinary tract infection. That's, <laughs> that's, that's right on. So, uh, so it's a bag of Bible that we've got to fight, each one of us. And the devil just sitting back, waiting. So, Miss Frida, you're talking about what the boys wanted to go do. Was it was it like very intelligent things, like to the chess club or the library? <laughs> right? Yeah. So, you know, we we as human beings and believers, unbelievers, but you know, we're talking about believers. Um, you know, Paul is trying to tell us how not to get stuck on stupid because we can do that and we'll we'll miss Christ. We'll not be paying attention. Uh, to his word, we'll skip out on prayer, uh, this time of communion, and so to not get stuck on stupid, we have to be transformed, right? Uh, that, that's a connotation of transfigured. We are changed by the renewing of your mind, right? And that's done through communion with God because his mercies are new every morning, uh, prayer, and the word. God, through prayer and through the word, God changes us and works in us, right? And it says, Messiah Jesus, he is wonderful, he is counselor, and nobody else, right? So this idea of don't, don't hire out the renewing of your mind to somebody who's going to use the wisdom of man, all right? Um, and we don't have time for me to get up on my soapbox about how People try to mix, you know, psychology and the Bible, uh, Maslow and Matthew. Uh, we don't need any Freud in Philippians, right? Uh, we don't need Carl Jung in Philemon, although Philemon was in Carl Jung, and if you want to know about that, I'll tell you. I'll tell you another time. Um, no, I can tell you that now. Carl, Carl Jung. Um, yeah, he was a student of Sigmund Freud, a very famous school of, of psychology. And, uh, and, and Christians like to read him and use his work because it's very spiritual sounding and he can talk some of this talk. Um, but he, he actually, to come up with his ideas, communed with a demon named Philemon. Um, and said, well, that's apocryphal. Actually, it's not. Uh, he kept a diary 
Um, it was in a red bound cloth book. And for, um, I think it was almost a hundred years, the Jung family would not let that book be seen by any other person. Uh, and then eventually they allowed it to be, uh, took it to a, you know, art restoration people, you know, encased in glass, a high, very high powered computer to take these detailed photographs. And they recreated this, uh, this red book uh, where he journaled and talked about uh, his, you know, conversations with Philemon the demon and where he got all this stuff from. And people use those ideas and there are Christians who, who use those, try to use those ideas and say, well, the Bible isn't good enough. We need that stuff to tell us how to work out problems of living. Uh, I actually had a copy of uh, that red book once upon a time, uh, and my wife made me get it out of the house. Uh, it had such a, a negative energy about it. Um, so I sent it and all of my psychotherapy books, and I traded them in for a pair of area cowboy boots. <laughs> uh, that's the definition of sanctification. Uh, 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 so the renewing of our mind, that happens, that's something that God does. Right? Because let God be true and every man a liar. And, and what do we do with that? Well, we prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So the proving, what, what do y'all think about that? So demonstrating, right? That that sense of the word. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's the proof of what it says as much as the evidence. Right. Mm -hmm. I think it does allow me that we might live to do it the perfect will of God. And that's what we've got to strive for. And there's a sense in which the proving um, is like um, Proofing a, proofing a mixture, right? A, a, a liquor or something like that. They proof it, right? What does that mean? It means to bring it up to a certain standard, right? Um, so we've got demonstrate, bringing it up to a certain standard, right? The standard is good and acceptable, and that is the will of God, right? That same will that we fall short of, right? Um, but in Christ, we don't. And... Um, and proving is also about testing, right? So testing. Um, in, in the Bible, we're, we're very cautious not to, not to try God, not to test God, you know, like, like a Santa Claus or a genie in a bottle. Uh, but I don't think that's what it's talking about, right? Um, if To prove that if you yield your body as a living sacrifice, right? If you allow prayer and the word to renew your mind, uh, then you're going to show that God was right all along, that his will is perfect, is good, and is, is acceptable uh, to who? Well, to him, right? And it's him working in us that which is good and perfect and acceptable, right? Because we can't do it, but he can, right? And he loves to take the, the hot mess that we are and make us good and perfect and acceptable to him. Right. Other thoughts? You know, the Malachite talks about, you know, the storehouse is the Lord's help proving it. You know, pay your, pay your tithes and things like that and see if I don't bless you. And I think a lot of this is just trust him. He's, he's saying, you know, trust me that I'll, you know, as you're renewing your mind and stuff, you know, I'll bring out the good and bring out uh, myself in you 
being, you know, us having a, um, I guess, being acceptable, you know, accepting the things he has for us, but trying to renew our mind and him, you know, I think a lot of it, like you said, is trying the Lord and he'll show us that he'll bring out that renewing in us if we trust him in the morning and start out uh, as our daily walk. He'll show, he'll show other people Christ in us. Right. Yeah, picking up that cross, uh, leaving it right there, dying to self, and yielding. Let God do what he wants to do in our lives and in the lives of our family, in our church, in our community, in our county, in our commonwealth, in our country, and in the world. And that's how, little by little, the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ will cover the earth as the water covers the seas. Okay. Well, verse 2, that's a good, that's a good place to stop. That's good. <laughs> thanks. Thanks for, thanks for joining me in this grand experiment. We're going we're to do it a little more next time. So, uh, so, come, so come ready and tell everybody else. They don't have to be so scared. Right? It wasn't that bad. It wasn't, it wasn't so painful. So, all right. Anything else before we close? Gracious God and Father, we thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you uh, that you uh, have provided us with your spirit, Lord, that could open the eyes of our hearts, Lord, to, to understand your word, Lord, to, uh, to have it meaningful to us, Lord, that we might be applied to our lives, Lord, so that we can go out uh, with all boldness and sincerity and charity and love uh, to demonstrate, Lord, um, what your will and your way uh, can do in the life of an individual person and in a group of people uh, that you call the church. Lord, I just pray uh, that we would be sensitive to your will, Lord, that we would yield ourselves to it, Lord, and that we would spend uh, the necessary time in your word, Lord, and in, in prayer and communion with you, that you can teach us, Lord, that you can help us to discern uh, in those moments that we need to be discerning in, uh, that you would have all glory and honor thereby, uh, and, that, and the name of Jesus Christ would be magnified, and those who do not believe, Lord, uh, would be, would be uh, affected, Lord, uh, and envious, and want to know more about what Christ has done for us, Lord. Uh, we thank you, we praise you, we love you, and I pray uh, your spirit guide and be upon, Lord, each and every uh, heart and home represented here, Lord, as we go out uh, this week uh, to carry out the work of your kingdom. I pray that you would bless us and keep us in all things and do so because we ask it in the name of our Lord and Savior.